Can everyone hear me? And can anybody see me? I'll try to grow a little bit. Here, is this better? Yes. Okay, well, welcome to my presentation. My name is Steve Sarowitz. I'm coming here from Chicago, and I'm the producer of a film called The Gate, and I'm here to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Baha'u'llah's birth. Now, it's kind of interesting that we just saw a film about the sun and the cycles of the sun and the renewal of the sun. And something Baha'u'llah used to like to um, compare the prophets of God to is the sun. He said in one day, the sun would appear in the sky, and the next day a sun would appear, and the next day a sun would appear. One day would be called Monday, and one day is called Tuesday, and one day is called Wednesday. And each sun is the same, yet it's different. And that's how he talks about the prophets of God. He doesn't say, well, Monday is better than Tuesday, is better than Wednesday. He says they're all good. And that's kind of how Baha'is look at the prophets, the messengers. We call them the spiritual sons, because that's what Baha'u'llah taught us. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a pretty new Baha'i. Uh, I'm what they call a baby Baha'i, maybe a toddler. I've, be, I've been a Baha'i since 2015. Um, I, years ago, graduated from a little school you guys probably never heard of in Urbana called the U of I. You've heard of it? Oh, that, that's good. Uh, I, I wasn't a great student. Uh, in fact, uh, not great was a step up from me. I, I was lucky to graduate. I bounced around for about 10 years, and I started a company uh, 10 years after I graduated called Paylocity. It was a little payroll service. We started with three employees in a 600-square-foot office. and. Uh, 20 years later, the company is now publicly held, has about 2,500 employees, and I get to make movies. And they don't let me run the company anymore, which is good. Uh, we have a great CEO. He was named number 11 on Glassdoor. Number 10 was Mark Zuckerberg. I think Mark Zuckerberg cheated, but don't tell him I said that. <laughs> he'll, he'll kick me off Facebook. Um, so let's talk about my movie, The Gate. So I became a Baha'i on February 10th. 2015. Three days later, I emailed my friend Farshid, who's also in the payroll business. That's what my company is, Paylocity, a payroll company. And I said, I'm a Baha'i now. And I jumped as high as a 49-year-old man can jump, which is not very high. And I said, I'm, I'm a Baha'i. I was very excited. He'd been a Baha'i all his life. He has been. His father was actually a martyr. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's an excellent movie coming out called Accomplice, which talks about what the Iranian government is doing to the Baha'is and has been doing for many years now. And his father was one of those Baha'is who was killed by the Iranian government. And when I took up my picture and I sent it to him, I emailed it to him, I was in front of a picture right behind me of about 100 martyrs from, the, from Iran. And number 49 in that picture, they were all numbered, was his father right behind me. And it just so happened that I was 49 years old. So I said to Farshid, I said, Farshid, I'm just going to retire in a couple years and I'm going to teach the Baha'i faith. And he said, well, you could do that, but you could make a movie. And if you just taught people, you could reach hundreds of people. But if you make a movie, you could reach millions of people. So here I am as a movie maker. Less than an hour later, I received a phone call from a man named Peter Samuelson. Actually, an email and then a phone call. Peter Samuelson is a movie producer. I'd never really talked to a movie producer before. Uh, Peter Samuelson's biggest movie is called, some of you are old enough to know this, some of you aren't. It was a famous movie in its day, Revenge of the Nerds. So for you young people, that was a famous movie for us old people. We liked it. And uh, so he produced Revenge of the Nerds and about 25 other movies. And, I, and he was e actually emailing me nothing to do about movies. He was asking me about philanthropy. We started doing the philanthropy work together with foster kids. And I asked him in the uh, phone call, I said, I, I have this movie that my friend said I should make. Should I go ahead and make it? He said, well, come out to L.A., kid, and we'll talk. And so I went out to meet Peter. And uh, two years later, almost to the day, uh, we filmed the first scenes of our movie. We interviewed a, a great scholar by the name of Dr. Nader Saidi in his living room. We also were very fortunate that same week. We were able, for those of you who are Baha'is here, uh, we also were able to interview another great scholar and great Baha'i by the name of Farooz. Kazemzadeh. And we got to interview him all, just before he passed away, which will be great for posterity. Well, our film is about the Bob. And as we were interviewing Farooz, we asked him a question, how did your family come to be Baha'i? And he said, my great, 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 I can't remember how many great grandfather, I think there's a few of them, he was 92 at the time, 
for those of you who don't know, he just passed away, an amazing man. He was there at the start of the UN. He was there in the South protesting uh, for civil rights. He was a professor at Yale at the time. He was a, a great Baha'i and he said, they're arresting people and no one cares. So I'm gonna go down as a Yale professor so they can arrest me and someone will care. And he did. Uh, he was also on the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is for many years. But anyway, we asked Farouz about who taught him the Baha'i faith and his, or his family and he said, my great great grandfather or so was taught by the Bob himself. And we have that on tape, and it will be in our movie. Now, who was the Bob? Okay, so raise your hand here if you're a Baha'i. Raise your hand if you're a Baha'i. And raise your hand if you're not a Baha'i. It's okay, you can raise your hand. Um, so a, a few of you um, may not know, who's never heard of the Bob? And who's heard of the Bob? Okay, so most of you have heard of the Bob. Uh, the Bob was the herald prophet who founded the Baha'i faith. And so in the 1840s, there was this huge expectation among three different faiths that someone was going to come. Um, among the Jews, they thought the Messiah was going to come. And they were looking at a book called the Zohar, and they expected the Messiah to come in the year 5600. Uh, by the way, for those of you who don't know the Jewish calendar that well, that's the year 1840. And they thought that the Jewish Messiah would bring all the people to the uh, Jewish people back to Israel and there'd be a great technological revolution. So let me ask someone who's young, actually you, you guys are in the front row, do you think we've had a technological revolution, let's say since 1844? A big one or a small one? The biggest one in history. So they do get the technological, actually we get the technological revolution. So if you really look around the world, everything that we see in our modern world has been virtually, has been invented since 1844, from cars to trucks to planes. Do you know there was a day before they had Instagram and cell phones and Facebook? I, you guys have never experienced that, but there was a day, and it was actually a little bit more recent than 1844. But cameras, and plastic, photography, anything electronic, transportation, communication, of course the Jews get their technological revolution. Now, let's see if anyone knows this. Did the Jews get to go back to Israel, let's say, in 1844? Anybody? I got some no's. I got some yeses. I'm going to go with yes. If a Baha'i ever asks you about 1844, just say yes. You'll probably be right. And it's March 21st, 1844, the Ottoman Edict of Toleration. The Jews get to go back to Israel. So that's kind of neat. And that, start, that starts the Great Migration, which ends uh, or culminates in the State of Israel in 1948, 104 years later. By that time, 700,000 uh, Jews had bought land in Israel and migrated back. So the Jews get two out of three, but they don't see the Messiah, so they were disappointed. This ended movements in Africa, North Africa, Southern Europe, and Persia, so the thousands of Jews that were looking for the Messiah are all disappointed. They get Israel as a consolation prize. And so we come to the Christians. All over the world, Christians are waiting for something big. So, anybody, what would be a big thing for Christians? Biggest thing ever. What? Return of Christ. So Christians all over the world. Now, if I ask a Christian today, when's Christ going to return? I don't know. I ask a lot of Christians because I guide at the Baha'i Temple. And they always say, I don't know, usually, occasionally soon. Almost never does anyone say, oh yeah, I know, tomorrow or Tuesday or this year. Nobody says that. But in 1840s, throughout the 1840s, millions of Christians thought that. And this wasn't just some crazy person on a street corner or somebody in a mental hospital. These were some of the major Christian leaders of their day, uh, some major names. Has anyone heard of Martin Luther? Martin Luther says 1840. He, he said that 300 years earlier. Joseph Smith, he says, the Son of Man shall herald the Son of Man like a light dawning from the East. He said that there are those of you who will not pass away. He was saying this in the 1830s before Christ returns. And he said if he was alive in 1890, he would see Jesus Christ or the return of Christ himself in person. Of course, he died. And guess what year Joseph Smith died? Anybody, was anybody paying attention to the year I keep saying? 1844. He died in June 1844. So he never did get to see if he was going to see Christ return in 1890 like he promised. So there was many, many more. The biggest one in America though, this is, and by the way, it says all over the world, Germany, France, Scandinavia, Switzerland, America, 300 ministers in America, 700 ministers in England, India, all over the world, Christians. Now why did all these Christians think that Christ would return? Well, because the Bible signs pointed to it. And the expert on that in America and the biggest following was a man named William Miller. Starts off as a farmer in 1831 
tells his family, oh, I've read the Bible. He'd read the Bible for two straight years, and then he'd actually examined his, fi his findings for four more, and he said, guess what? Christ is going to return in 18, what year again? 1844. And Miller guarantees this to his family. And then he makes a pact with God, this farmer. He's kind of a shy guy. He says, you know, I'm not going to talk about this publicly unless someone asks me. Less than an hour later, his son-in-law asks him to talk at a church that Sunday. And he does go talk at this small church. And 13 years later, the farmer, William Miller, is now the Reverend William Miller. He's an, he's an ordained minister with over 100,000 followers. And they all think that Christ is going to return on October 22, 1844, and they're going to get raptured up to heaven. And does that happen? Well, they, the world didn't end like they expected. They weren't raptured up to heaven, and they didn't see Christ return. So it was called the Great Disappointment. And that's uh, October 23rd, what year? 1844. 1844. So while we're talking about 1844, so William Miller, by the way, died thinking that his calculations were right. He just couldn't figure out why Christ didn't return. Now, the whole thing about the world ending, that was when, you know, if you looked at Bibles back then, it said the world would end seven times when Christ returned. Now, it doesn't say that because all the new Bibles say the end of the age versus the end of the world. So that's changed a little bit. But uh, the Bible still says mostly the same things. They just found they mistranslated that one word. So now we come to the Muslims. Now, what do the Muslims have to do with this? Well, they're waiting for the 12th Imam to return. He disappeared in 260, the occultation of the 12th Imam, and he's supposed to return a thousand years later in 1260. Can anyone guess what 1260 in Muslim years would be in Christian years? Just so happens it's 1844. And so there's tens of thousands of Muslims called the Sheikhis in Persia waiting for the return of the 12th Imam in 1844. And does he return? Of course. That's why we're here. We're here to talk about the Bab and eventually the, the prophet, the messenger that he heralded, which is Baha'u'llah. And we're celebrating Baha'u'llah's 200th birthday. He was born in 1817. The Bab was born in 1819 in Shiraz, Persia. He, um, he declared on May 23rd, 1844, as this return of the 12th Imam to Mullah Hussein. And you're going to actually see a clip of Mullah Hussein. For those of you who are Baha'is, hopefully you'll like it. Um, it's Adam Monshine, uh, a great Baha'i, comes from a great Baha'i family who's playing Mullah Hussein. Um, so the Bab declares, and he goes to Mecca. Actually, I, sh I should say the next day, the very next day, May 24th, is the invention of the telegraph, the very first telegraph, the start of the electronic age. What hath God wrought? Then the Bab goes to Mecca. Pub he, he publicly declares they don't really pay attention to him. Comes back to Persia and starts getting a lot of followers. So the king sends the number one religious scholar, Vahid, to check him out in all of Persia. And he comes to check out this 25-year-old merchant with a sword. He's come with a sword to kill him if he doesn't answer correctly. He meets with him three times. Uh, the third time he meets with the Bab, the Bab reveals over 2,000 verses. And... Bahid, who's seen the Quran, knows it very well, is so amazed just watching him reveal the Word of God for several hours that he actually passes out. The Bab had to stop revealing the Word of God to resuscitate Bahid. And at the end of watching him, Bahid says, if all the powers on earth were leagued against me, I would not abandon my confidence in this cause. And he doesn't. He actually follows the Bab the rest of his life. Five years later, gives his life in service of the Bab. The Bab gets over 100,000 followers, over 400 religious scholars, and the problem is the mullahs. It's always the religious leaders, has been generation after generation in every age. And so the religious leaders have a contract, and in the clause in their contract, basically their contract with their people says, we're only in power until the 12th Imam comes. And now the 12th Imam has most obviously come right on time. And so they should accept him. What do you guys think? Do they accept him? No. Not so much. So they put him in jail, doesn't work, the jailer becomes a believer. Put him in another jail, another remote jail, that doesn't work, that jailer becomes a believer. So they put him on trial, and they ask him, who are you? And the Bob says, I am, I am, I am the promised one you've been expecting for a thousand years. And now they have to kill him. And this is the opening scene of our movie, July 9th, 1850, the martyrdom of the Bob. They go to get him out of his cell, and he says, oh, I'm sorry. Can't go right now. I'm talking to my secretary, and no force can take me until I'm ready to go. But they take him anyway. They tie him up against the wall. They tie up a 20-year-old follower. 
by the name of Anise. Sam Khan, the executioner, gives the order, 750 shots ring out. And when the smoke cleared in front of 10,000 people, okay, I want all the Baha'is to be quiet. A non-Baha'i, raise your hand. What happened? Was he dead or alive? Any non-Baha'i here? Someone, what's that? We're going to go with alive. Very good guess. And you're right, and he wasn't there. So in front of 10,000 people, the Bob simply disappeared. Anis was standing there unharmed. The ropes had been shot through, and they found the Bob minutes later, after a frantic search, several minutes later, in his cell, finishing his mission, talking to his secretary, as he said he needed to do. So he finishes talking to his secretary. He says, okay, you can kill me now. And they take him. They tie him up again. They tie up Anis again. And Sam Khan, the executioner, the original executioner, pulls all his troops, says, you can shoot me. I'm never doing him harm again the rest of my life. They get another regiment. Sam Khan was Christian. The second regiment is Muslim, 750 people. And they do shoot and kill the Bab and Anis. And they don't stop there. The government and the mullahs have been killing the Babis, his followers, for a couple years. And they end up, by 1852, having killed all of his followers, all of his leaders, save two in his movement. There's one of his disciples. He had 18 disciples. One of his disciples still alive. Her name is Tahere. Now, Tahere is a great story. She pulls off her veil in 1848. She says, this is a new age for all humanity. And the key to this new age, one of them, is women's rights. Days later, the Seneca Falls Convention spontaneously breaks out. For those of you who are too young to know what that is, that is the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Now, Tahere is beautiful and brilliant and brave, so beautiful, the king says, the Shah says, will you marry me? And Tahere says, you keep your religion, I'll keep mine. She doesn't want to go back to being a Muslim. Um, she's so brilliant that the scholars can't even track with her. She's an amazing scholar. And she's incredibly brave. But they eventually arrest her like they arrest the rest of the leaders or kill, and they kill her as well. Before she dies, she says, you can kill me as soon as you like, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. And so that goes on this very day. And as you've read in the papers recently, it's not all there yet. But what Baha'u'llah says, and that's the only one left alive, he says that women and men are wings of a bird. And the bird, the whole bird, cannot fly properly until both wings are exactly equal. So those of us who have the stronger wing, or, which just means more rights, not physically stronger, must help the weaker wing until both wings have equal rights, complete equal rights. And then the bird of humanity can fly. Now, who is this Baha'u'llah? Well, he was uh, a son of a provincial governor, one of the wealthiest men in Persia. He grew up with great wealth. Um, he didn't care about that. At an early age, he was known for his wisdom when he was only about 12 or 13. Um, he was also known by his late teens as the father of the poor. When he was 22, his father passed away. He turns down a provincial governorship, which just simply wasn't done in Persia. And a few years later follows the Bab. And in 1852, this great, wise, and kind nobleman, they arrested him for a crime he didn't commit. They burned his hometown. They took away his great wealth. They put 100-pound chains on his shoulders. They chained him to five other people, and they put him in an awful place, three stories underground, called the Black Pit. And it was in the Black Pit where Baha'u'llah saw a maiden that told him he was the promised one of all faiths, and that he was for the Hindus, the Kalki avatar, for the Buddhists, the fifth Buddha, for the Christians, the return of Christ, for the Muslims, also the return of Christ, who they call Isa or Jesus, and for the Jews, the Messiah. And if there's any Zoroastrians, the Shah Baram. And so what his mission is, he said, he wrote for 40 years. That was the uh, Muslim uh, prophecy that Isa, when he returns, will reign for 40 years. And he did, 1852 to 1892, when he passed away. And he wrote the equivalent of 60 Christian Bibles. And essentially what he said is that he was here for something called, with something called the most great peace for humanity. And we get this when we understand the oneness of humanity. And the oneness of humanity is to be achieved when we understand that we get rid of all the barriers that separate us. So first of all, women are equal to men, always have been in the eyes of God. So get rid of sexism. There's only one race, the human race. Get rid of racism. And that's now been proven scientifically. In the 1800s, nobody thought that. He says there's, the earth is but one country and mankind is citizens, so get rid of nationalism. And think back in the 1800s, that was so 
long before planetariums and our global society and all the technology we have, the internet and airplanes. Nobody, nobody really thought of a global society. And lastly, he said, all these great religions we have are wonderful chapters in the same book. Christianity and Judaism and Islam and now Baha'i, all of them, Hinduism, Buddhism, are all great chapters, but they're, none of them is a book unto themselves, and all the chapters are to be worshipped and adored, all the messengers, and he's the latest messenger, and to think of it as one, and to think of humanity as one, and if we could do that, we might have this peace thing. And so my movie is to introduce to the world the Bob, and really the Baha'i faith. And so I, I brought it. Does anyone want to see a scene or two from the movie? Okay. So why don't we start with the location one? Just to show you, we, we filmed it in Spain, and these are some of the locations we filmed at. And maybe I'll step out of the way because I'm a little tall. Filming in Spain was absolutely breathtaking. We filmed at incredible places that uh, a guy living on the south side of Chicago would only dream of seeing. Don't let him fool you. He's been to some incredible places. Our locations on the entire shoot were phenomenal. We were shooting underneath the world-famous Alhambra Palace. Parker. We're filming some street scenes here in Granada. We rented a 10th century castle. We filmed at forts neighborhoods, deserts, wonderful castles. To think that we're able to shoot here is really quite a gift. So you can see that we had some spectacular uh, places to shoot. Now why did we shoot in Spain? Well we wanted to shoot in a Muslim country. Our first choice was Turkey, but then things started blowing up in Turkey. If you've been following news maybe about a year or so ago. And then we thought well, we'll go to Morocco. That sounds like a really exotic place and it has a great Muslim history. The Moors coming up into Europe. In fact, uh, really where we shot was all from the Moors. And unfortunately, we talked to the Moroccan Baha'is and they said, no, don't come. Um, and the reason is there's extremists in Morocco. And so here's the thing. Throughout the Muslim world, there's prejudice against the Baha'is. And even in Morocco, which is relatively peaceful, we were told not to come. So we went to Spain which, of course, the Moors controlled Spain, uh, parts of it anyway, for 700 years. And so there's a lot, Alhambra that Ed mentioned, Alcazar, these are beautiful former Muslim palaces. And so they really look like it's a, and we could shoot and make it look like a Muslim country. Um, it's sad that we couldn't go to an actual Muslim country, but hopefully, uh, God willing, inshallah, as the Muslims say, uh, we could um, someday shoot in a Muslim country. We have more movies to shoot. Um, so the first thing, uh, we have a, a nice little piece on women's rights. I uh, wanted to show you a little clip on the, on the woman who played Tahare in our movie. In Muhammad's days, the reason why his wives were covered was for their protection. Well, we're in 2017 now, and we don't need for such old customs. Hello, my name is Tala Dilbanani, and I am playing the role of Tahiri. Tahiri was extremely unusual for her time, her culture, and her place. She is just a profound woman that was very active in the Baha'i faith and in women's rights. Now, at that time, women were veiled. It was considered a sin to look at the shadow of a woman, let alone look directly at her face. So, as a sign of the new age of religion, she rips off her veil in front of all of these mullahs. She's sending a signal that this is a new age, this is a new era, that women will no longer be subservient by wearing the veil. Tahere was incredibly passionate because she believed the Baha'i faith would elevate the status of women and would mark the beginning of a new spiritual awakening for humanity. I believe women in this day and age hold just as much power and knowledge as men do, and there should be no reason why we can't catch up with religion to the times. And if you've been reading the headlines recently from Hollywood, uh, some of the people there don't think that women are equal, and, and I think it's a shame. It's a shame for them, and it's a shame for the women who are abused, and I hope that in the film industry, 
women can be fully equal and that these things that have been happening for years can go away. And so our film is, is about equality for women, not putting women down. Uh, what's the next clip? Adam. So um, Adam Monshine played Mullah Hussein. And so here's a little clip of Adam Monshine. I think we could make the whole movie about Adam. You'll see why. Adam Monshine. I play Mullah Hussein. And I'd like to thank you for joining me at my home. It's really sweet. In my breakfast note, we could, hold on. I'm sorry, I'm being told this is a historical landmark and I don't live here. And I'm also being told there's nothing in my ear. <laughs> Mullah Hussein was a really deepened scholar. Uh, of Islam. One that's a rising sun with the immensity of his knowledge. His master, his teacher, was Sayyid Kazim, and he was renowned for being so learned. It reminds me of Kung Fu, where the students all had this relationship and veneration of their master, and different schools of Kung Fu would challenge each other, and challenge the master, and they would obviously fight, but um, this analogy is less fighting and more discuss interpretations of passages in the Quran, and you'd have different schools of thought. And that was part of what this time period where the story is taking place, uh, why it's so important. As a Baha'i and an actor, it, there is a certain sense of pressure to do justice to this life. The biggest challenge for me is pretending I'm in a scene with the manifestation of God. And then imagining what Mullah Hussein must have felt like, I can only scratch the surface of that. So you get a feel for Adam Monshine. One day, one second he's cracking you up and the next second he's serious. And he was like that, an incredibly deep in Baha'i. Uh, he is like that. And uh, someone suggested actually, uh, if any of you know Jane the Virgin, uh, Justin Baldoni, who's uh, Raphael and Jane the Virgin, maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, he recommended uh, Adam Monshine as the narrator, but we're not using him as a narrator. Uh, a few weeks before we filmed, I just had an epiphany. I said, we have to call Adam Monshine. He's the guy for Mullah Hussein. We were, had been having trouble finding him and it was a, kind of more of a vision. I can't say it was brilliance on my part. I think it was Baha'u'llah telling me that. But uh, we are using Adam's wife, Yanni King Monshine, as our narrator. So his wife will be our narrator in the film. Uh, the next one is Why Baha'i, correct? And that's from Kayla, who's our field producer. And she's the one who made all these clips. A lot of people that I talk to are very distressed about the nature of the world, either in their own country, the political situation, or the, the bombings, the, the terrorism that still goes on. Actually, yesterday there was a bombing in Manchester, yet another one. Y a mí cuando hay noticias así se me hace el día muy intenso, no, muy pesado. La cabeza me da mil vueltas. Hay sentimientos encontrados. One of our crew members, Zaira, a woman who is in charge of the extras on the set. She lost her eye in a terrorist attack in Madrid over 13 years ago. No tengo recuerdo de lo que fue la explosión, pero sí recuerdo el despertarme en el tren y comenzar a pedir ayuda. Those of us who are Baha'is understand that the solution to problems such as these uh, rest with the divine messenger that was sent to humanity. 174 years ago. And he brought a message of love and understanding. The message is that all of mankind, all of humankind is one. That women and men are equal. Uh, get rid of racism, there's only one race. Get rid of nationalism. The earth is but one country and mankind is citizens. And that all of these wonderful religions we celebrate and are members of are actually part of one great faith of God and that each religion is not its own separate religion but rather a chapter of one great eternal faith that God continually I personally am not a Baha'i, but I've always found it really interesting and rather beautiful that they embrace all religious traditions and 
You know, each time an attack like this happened, I just wonder, you know, what if what if the world embraced this sort of philosophy? What where would we be at? Would we be in a better place? For those of you who don't know, that's the shrine of the Bob and we think that's Baha'is think that's a better place. That's heaven on earth. I'll actually be there in a few weeks um, with my family, with my wife anyway. Um, the next one is, oops, the next one is the Black Pit, correct? Uh, that's with uh, Ed, Ed Price in the Black Pit. Ed is a Baha'i, he's a co-producer, and uh, I think this video will show you kind of the emotion that we all had, all of us who were Baha'is, in making this movie. And uh, Ed's a, a really, he's been a Baha'i for over 40 years. He likes to say 44 years. When I say 40, he reminds me, it's 44. Um, go ahead and, and show that clip and you can kind of see how so emotional Ed is. Too. My name is Edward Price. I'm one of the writers of the movie script. He just did the visualization of the time when Baha'u'llah was in the prison. He's the one that the Bab said everybody should be waiting for. And now, two years after his martyrdom, he's in this incredibly dark, miserable prison in chains, chains that are so heavy it scarred him for life. This is the moment in history when the promised one of all the ages actually received his moment of revelation. It's the burning bush, it's the, the dove at the River Jordan, it's the angel Gabriel to Muhammad, it's Buddha under the Bodhi tree. This is the moment. And we just filmed it. I can't believe that out of all the Baha'is in the world I had this privilege. And if I never do anything else in my life, this will be enough. So why don't we take a break from the clips and, and uh, see if anybody has any questions. First of all, did you guys like the clips? Um, and the film is even better. Uh, I think the film itself, I saw the first couple of uh, scenes that we've put together, starting with the martyrdom of the Bob, and we have great scenes about the Adventist movements. I think you guys will really love the movie. We're working hard at it. Uh, Bob Hercules has been making uh, document documentaries for 30 years. Uh, Keith Walker, the director of photography, they have been partners for 30 years. So we have an amazing cameraman. We have an amazing director. Uh, we, uh, Kayla is very experienced. We have an, a very experienced editor who's working on it right now. So we have a lot of really good people, by the way, none of whom are Baha'is. So this is not a movie made by Baha'is for non-Baha'is. This is a movie made by Baha'is and non-Baha'is for everybody which if anyone knows anything about the Baha'i Faith, that's what we should be doing. So any questions from anybody about the movie? Yes, sir. We are in editing right now, so we finished filming except uh, the narrator comes last and it's our plan to take uh, Yanni to Haifa and uh, film the last little bit with her in Haifa. Basically the narrator, all the narrator scenes will be filmed in Haifa at the Shrine of the Bab. And of course people won't know that till the end of the film. So I think what we're going to do is do close-up scenes on the Shrine of the Bob, and then towards the very end of the film, we'll do a pan out and we'll show people where we've been filming. Which, by the way, those of you who have never seen the Shrine of the Bob, it is, if not the most beautiful place on earth, one of them. Any other questions about the film, or about Baha'i, or about Pelocity, or about the, the weather, the sun? Did I bore you guys? Are you guys awake? Yes, sir. Uh, how, does it, how do you plan to get the film rolled out? Is it for theaters, for YouTube? Or? So I got an email a few months ago from somebody who said, would you like to put your film on ABC? ABC is looking for films. They, there's a little uh, independent company, or it's a nonprofit called uh, Interfaith Film uh, Council, um, and, and they, IFC. And so this Interfaith Film Council, they, they put uh, films onto ABC, four films a year. And they said, well, one of the categories was a film about the founder of faith. I thought, well, we have a film. They're all documentaries they do. And so I thought, well, we have a documentary about the founder of faith. Well, I'll talk to them. And she says, well, show me a trailer of your film. I said, I don't have one yet. 
I said, we're still filming it. I think we just filmed, finished uh, the, the reenactments in Spain, but I had very little to show her. And I described the movie, and she actually bought it sight unseen. Because I explained to her, you know, I told her we had all the funding, which is unusual, and that we had very experienced people working on it. But most importantly, she was dying to get a good documentary from the Baha'is. And the reason is she'd done a, another documentary herself, and she'd interviewed Laylee Miller, who was also in our film. And anyone who interviews Laylee loves the Baha'i faith. I wish I was half as good a teacher as Laylee. I wish we had half as many, I wish we had just a few more, a few more Laylees in the world and there'd be a lot more Baha'is. She's an amazing woman. Uh, her organization that she does, Tahare Justice Center, is an amazing organization. So after meeting Laylee, uh, Deborah, the woman uh, who was our contact there, she said, uh, yeah, we'd love a Baha'i movie. And so she told us, yes, I'd like to do it. And so we, a few, about a month ago, we signed with ABC to put it on ABC next May. So that's a very big thing because there's never been a, a major release of a Baha'i film on national TV in America. And we, we aim on putting it out internationally uh, in Farsi uh, with, with subtitles in German and, and many other languages, French and Spanish, really worldwide to the Baha'i community and well beyond the Baha'i community. And we have the money to do it, which is good. We have either subtitles too for us half people. What kind of subtitles? You know what, if, uh, if you'd like it, we'll do it. From, well, since you asked and you're the one who taught me the faith, I'd have to do it for you. <laughs> yeah, there's a question over here on, on the right, maybe? Yeah. Have you met any unexpected uh, resistance to making the film? And will the, the business with ABC limit the potential Not in the long run. We think it'll be helpful because it'll give the film credibility. The ABC deal will give it credibility. Um, we're not in this to make money. I, I um, am fortunately in the position where I don't have to ever make money the rest of my life. And so this is a project of love for me, not to make money. I am going to try to make the money back that I put into the film, mainly to show people that you can make money at a Baha'i film. Any excess money that we make beyond what we've spent, if there is any, will go to the faith. And we, that was our deal. We were working very closely with both the NSA and the Universal House of Justice uh, to make this right. And we've told them every step of the way, it's their, you know, their final say, that we will honor their wishes. And so they're very happy with us. We're thrilled with them. Um, me as a new Baha'i, I'm just thrilled I get to talk to them, really, um, and you get their guidance. And, and their guidance has been great. You know, it's new to them, and I'm amazed by their humility and uh, but they've also given us very good guidance, and it's been very interesting because we can't portray the Bob, since as Baha'is we can't portray any manifestation or, or messenger of God. So to make a movie uh, where the main character can never be shown is a bit of a challenge, and so we had to run that all the way up. We actually spent the day filming um, in Chicago uh, all sorts of different variations of showing the Bob, showing his shoulder, his hand, shadow. Uh, Universal House of Justice asked for it, they looked at it, and they said, oh, none of them work. <laughs> So we spent about $30,000 uh, trying to figure out, at, at the, the request of the Universal House of Justice, to see if it would work. And they wanted to see it. So we basically had kind of, it's kind of neat that we set that precedent for the world, because you know, that may be for many, hundreds of years that they've made that decision based on the film that we shot. So it was worthwhile. Um, in terms of other distribution, uh, film festivals will be a little bit more limited because of ABC, but I think, uh, Streaming should be better, and it'll give us a lot of credibility. We're going to be doing a lot of social media promotion, and we're going to count on Baha'i communities, hear this, Baha'i communities all over to do screenings. And so we're going to, we actually have hired someone to coordinate that. Sure. Uh, did you had a, someone else had a question? Yeah. Did anyone else have a question or no? Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, there was a film about Muhammad called The Messenger. Mm -hmm. We did. What uh, thoughts did you have about that? It doesn't matter what our thoughts were. The house turned it down. <laughs> they didn't say no. <laughs> the house said no. They said no point of view. So 
we are doing actually blocking shots. They, we think that's going to fly, and we're doing some uh, um, absent figure. That's all we can get. So really, not even point of view. Michael also asked if you uh, encountered any kind of... Oh, resistance. Um, you know, one thing I would say is, as I get into this project, being a relatively new Baha'i, I, uh, I am a successful business person, and sometimes people can tell you how great you are. And I've just become a lot smaller <laughs> and more humble and realize how little I have to do with any success of this. Um, I would say it's precisely the opposite so far. Like this independent, uh, 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 this uh, interfaith film uh, commission, they're um, just falling into our laps. Um, meeting Bob Hercules, the director, so easily. Actually, I was introduced to him right when I got back from California, and he's amazing. Um, and then he, of course, has Keith, who's amazing. And I, I just haven't had to work that hard. I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about the film industry. And uh, there's been person after person that's helped me. Uh, Rain Wilson from The Office, he's been wonderful. I've had the chance to meet some amazing Baha'is. Uh, I'd love to say that it was a struggle. I mean, I can tell you business has been a struggle at times, building businesses, but I just tell people now that I'm going to step aside and let Bahala do the guiding, and I'll just try to hang on for the ride. I really think I, it, this has been divinely blessed, this movie. It's been a very smooth ride. Now, I do think we're going to get a lot of resistance when we release it. I expect that, and I'm anticipating, and I'm anticipating that some of the existing uh, religious groups who have power may not like this, and I would be happy if that happened, because that would mean we're successful. I am now. You should have told us then. <laughs> I don't know how it's actually going to come off in the film, and so I, I don't know the answer there. But Ed was really our Baha'i expert and not our. Uh, I haven't heard any complaints about the chains, but if we get complaints, we'll have to adjust. Uh, we're doing the best we can, and so that's one of the things we have to watch out for. Did you notice in, in, the, in the scene with uh, Mullah Hussein, where he's sitting there in the Bob's house? We actually built that from scratch, so from, from photographs of the Bob's house. The same thing with the, uh, uh, the execution scene, uh, which I didn't show you, the uh, martyrdom of the Bob. There's a wall that a lot of Baha'is know. And so one of my emails uh, right around, this is going back a few months ago, was build the wall. And uh, Bob, who's, I'm not political, but Bob caught it. I didn't mean it that way, I just said build the wall. I literally meant build the wall to, for our scene. And uh, that can have a second meaning, I found out. <laughs> and uh, all I meant was to build the wall because it was a, it, it was a choice because I wanted to be accurate for the Baha'is. So non-Baha'is wouldn't know, but Baha'is would know. So we tried to build a wall that was similar to the martyrdom of the Bob. And so we were, very, we're trying our best. Please forgive us if we miss once in a while, but we're trying our best to be accurate. The costumes, by and large, we spent a lot of time making those accurate as well. Yes. Uh, well, Laylee is like, uh, she's an amazing hero of mine. Uh, Laylee is an amazing Baha'i. Um, I went, so my wife and I um, are donors to the Tahereh Justice Center. Laylee was about just out of law school in her early 20s, about 20 years ago, and she takes on this uh, pro bono case to help a refugee, and it becomes a landmark case. And she was actually told to, to start the Tahereh Justice Center. She didn't have any clients didn't have any money, and a lawyer said to her, don't worry, I'll take care of that, and he did. And he really helped, helped her get started, and now they help hundreds of women every year, and refugee women. Um, uh, my wife is Catholic, so I, I was raised Jewish, my wife is Catholic, and my wife's not a Baha'i, and so she gets a little tired of me being Baha'i all the time. 
And so when I tell her I want to introduce her to this woman who's a Baha'i who runs a nonprofit, you could just watch my eyes roll, my, my wife's eyes rolling and saying, oh my God, another Baha'i project. What are we getting now? So I introduced her to, to Lely. And of course, Lely, uh, so we, we uh, fund about 50 nonprofits. And Lely has her numbers perfect. I mean, her, her brochure is beautiful. Her numbers are perfect, which by the way, if you fund nonprofits, that's not the usual. They usually are a little, what's that number? She knew her stuff cold. And her cause is beautiful. And Lely's just a beautiful soul. But the, the, the killer was my wife's from Honduras. And over 50% of the women that they help are from Central America. And I won't tell you the brutal stories, but I'll just tell you that every woman here, every girl here, first every person here should be grateful that they're not a young woman in Central America because of all the suffering that they have. And so Lely is helping them. And of course, I'm married to a woman who came from that area. So it's a little emotional for me to see what she's doing. And so my wife, um, she said, OK, I get it. And we funded Lely. <laughs> and Lely, in turn, which is very interesting, asked my wife to come on the board because my wife is an amazing uh, uh, philanthropist. She, she runs our family foundation. She's really, really dedicated, and that's really her, her focus in life. So it's really a, a meeting, a really interesting meeting. Uh, Lely uh, does great work. She's very passionate about the work. One of the things that impresses me most about Lely is that she very publicly says, I'm running this organization on Baha'i values. Most of her employees are not Baha'is, but they love her and they love the faith, and she doesn't pressure them all to become Baha'is, but they love what she does and they respect what she does. And that, to me, is a great example of, for me, because I'm a new Baha'i, on how to run a Baha'i business. And so I actually have a for-profit business, and I'm, I'm thinking about lately as I start telling people, yes, I, we, I am a Baha'i, I'm going to run this on Baha'i values, but you can do whatever you want. And uh, it's kind of a model for me personally, an inspiration. And Laylee's very inspirational. She's amazing. Yes? So Rain Wilson says to me, the guy you have to hire is Farzam Salami. And I had heard about him before. And so I, I called up Farzam and talked to him, and he sent us his music, and it was unanimous. Once everyone heard his music, everyone said, we're not hiring anyone else. Farzam, I was telling these young ladies here that, that about Farzam Salami before I, sp I started speaking. Farzam is a miracle. I think he's amazing as well, because you hear me use that word. But I, again, I, I just think I've met some amazing people along the, along the way. When he was 14 years old, he was in Iran. He was not a Baha'i. He was, he was raised in a Muslim family in Iran. And uh, the government came to his family and said, uh, we want you to uh, work for us. And uh, all you have to do is sign this little contract that uh, says you can never leave the country ever. And we'll give you cars and houses and whatever else you want. And money, lots of it. It turns out Farzam is this computer genius at 14. And apparently they'd noticed that. And so, when the government of Iran says they're going to give you money and cars and houses, most 14-year-olds would say yes. But his father said, don't do it. And so Farzam didn't sign the contract. Uh, not so many years later, he came to America, and he ended up getting two master's degrees. One's from the Berkeley School of Music, uh, B-E-R-K-L-E-E, -E, very, very prestigious school of music. And the other is in computer science. And he um, eventually ends up going back to Iran to visit his family. And when he came there, they arrested him, the government did, and tortured him for several hours naked, actually, um, because he had sent a song to Barack Obama. Not because he was being political, he just happened to like Barack Obama. By the way, this, and Justin Baldoni told me this, Barack Obama's roommate in college, guess what religion he was? Baha'i. So uh, anyways, a little, little ties there. I don't know if anyone saw the, uh, the letter recently from Jimmy Carter about the Baha'i faith. Has anyone seen that letter? Anyone who hasn't seen that letter should read it. It's an amazing letter. And my friend uh, actually uh, had a dream before they met Jimmy Carter to go teach him the faith, and they ended up teaching him the faith the next day. So I don't know if it was my friends who taught him. Anyway. Uh, that letter will be on the table outside. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. I, lo I love that letter. Anyway, going back to Farzam, Farzam then came, to, came back to America. He was able to escape, and he became a Baha'i about two years ago. And he is really inspired by this project. He's an incredible genius. He plays over 30 instruments. He sings. I really think that Farzam thinks in music. <laughs> 
He's a genius, he, and I think he's going to be famous someday. I think he's going to do a great job, and I'm not worried about the music. The other thing I want to do, and this is my idea, is I want to have all the prominent uh, Baha'i uh, singer-songwriters, people like uh, Casey Porter, uh, who are the other, uh, uh, Luke Slot, several of the people around the world that, uh, that sing Baha'i music. And I want them to all make songs for this movie, in original songs, and then kind of publish them with the movie and put one of them in the movie in the trailer. Uh, if anyone's seen the movie Selma, that's a great, uh, a great song, When the Glory Comes. Of course, us Baha'is, at least I did, think of something else when that song came out. I still do. Because uh, Baha'u'llah's name means the glory of God. Anyway, so long answer to a short question. I'm really thrilled with Farzam, and we think that that's in good hands. Anybody else? Questions? You guys looking forward to seeing the movie? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it coming out. Um, you know, it's, it's been a long time. It's been 150 years since Baha'u'llah declared. And I think it's time the world knows who Baha'u'llah was. And I always say to people to the, in, when I'm teaching, when I'm guiding, when I'm teaching them the faith at the temple, Baha'i temple, I always ask them this question. I say, look at the world today. Wouldn't, what do you think? Is it better the way it is, or would it be better if people believe this way? Just, just like Kayla, who's not a Baha'i, said, wouldn't it be better if we all believed that humanity were one? And so that's really, as Baha'is, that's what we believe, and that's, that's our main point. That was Baha'u'llah's main point. It wasn't that Baha'is are better than anyone else. It wasn't that we should separate ourselves. It's that we should all be one. And so I hope, if, for those of you who are not Baha'is, that you might draw some inspiration from this. I hope that you might read some of what Baha'u'llah wrote someday. Um, I would suggest uh, Hidden Words as a, a nice little thing to hear what he wrote. Um, there's a lot of good books about the Baha'i Faith. But more importantly, thank you guys for listening and giving me the time here to talk today and for watching our clips. And please, uh, if you, I mean, I've got uh, on the table outside uh, little postcards uh, about the movie. The website is thegatefilm.com. And so I'd love you guys to see it, and I'd love to come back to Champaign and do a showing of the movie. So if anyone can arrange that, maybe next summer I'm available. Oh. And